Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to TechWise. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your moderator for Episode 3. This is a new show that we've designed with our friends from Techopedia, a very cool website that obviously focuses on technology. And of course, here at the Bloor Group, we focus quite keenly on enterprise technology, so enterprise software of all kinds. And the whole TechWise format was designed to give our attendees a real good hard look at a specific space. So we've done Hadoop, for example. We did analytics in the last show. And in this particular show, we're talking all about cloud. So it's called the cloud imperative, what, where, when, and how. And we're going to talk with a couple analysts today and then three vendors. So Cubal, Cloudant, and Attunity are the sponsors of today's show. Big thanks to those folks for their time and attention today. And a big thanks, of course, to all of you out there. And keep in mind that as attendees of these shows, you play a significant role. We want you to ask questions, get involved, get interactive, let us know what you think, because obviously the whole purpose of the show here is to help you guys understand what's happening out there in the world of cloud computing. So let's move right along. Of course, host, your host up there, Eric Cavanaugh, that's me. And then we have Dr. Robin Bloor calling in from an airport, as a matter of fact. And our good friend Gilbert Van, Gilbert Van Kutsum, an independent analyst, is also going to be sharing some thoughts with you. Then we'll hear from Ashish Tuso, CEO and co-founder of Cubo. We'll hear from Mike Miller, chief scientist at Cloudant. And finally, from Lawrence Schwartz, VP of Marketing at Attunity. So we've got a whole lot of content lined up for you today. So <laughs> the cloud. Eat it from above. This is a concept that, that came to me the other day when I was thinking about this. Really, cloud computing is just huge these days. I mean, it's really quite fascinating to watch the evolution of this stuff. And one of the examples I often give is in the webcasting technology itself. Of course, those of you who were dialed in early heard us going through some interesting technical challenges. That is one problem with the cloud is it does change. Formats change, standards change, interfaces change. And sometimes when you try to hook up two different areas together, you get some difficulty, you get some trouble. So this is actually one of the things to worry about with cloud computing. Be careful about architecture. You can see that as the last bullet point. One of the things that we do, just as a side note here for our webcast, is we have a separate phone conferencing vendor. Then we use WebEx. We do not use the WebEx audio because, frankly, one time we used WebEx audio years ago and it crashed and burned in a most unpleasant way. And I was not willing to, uh, to run that risk again. So we use our own audio uh, recording company called Arcadent, as a matter of fact, and we stitch together in, in real time all these different solutions. And the idea is that we could then email you with a separate uh, email application with the slides in case, for example, WebEx were to crash. We'd tell you all to dial in. We'd email you the slides and just go through it more or less without the WebEx kind of environment. So there are ways that you can get around these kinds of problems, but these kinds of issues are all over the place. But there are lots of benefits to cloud. Obviously, it's a low barrier to entry. You look at the, the poster child of cloud computing is Salesforce.com, of course, which just revolutionized business, specifically Salesforce automation, obviously. But then you've got stuff like Marketo and Eye Contact and Constant Contact and Sail Through. And goodness gracious, in terms of marketing and sales automation, there are tons of tools. But that's not all there is. HR is getting into the whole cloud game. Analytics is in the cloud game. Look at that uh, little-known company out there, Amazon Web Services, what they're doing with cloud computing. It's just massive. And I heard a great quote the other day from a guy uh, we do a lot of work with, David Bessemer, who now is over at uh, Cisco, as a matter of fact, the company that bought WebEx. Not sure they've invested as much as I would like them to have in WebEx, but that's not really my decision, is it? But uh, he is at Cisco these days, and he had a very funny, just pithy quote. He said, a lot of people forget there's not one cloud, there are many clouds. And that's exactly right. There are lots and lots of clouds out there. In fact, every cloud provider is its own cloud. So one of the challenges in these days is to connect clouds, right? If you're Salesforce, wouldn't it be nice to connect directly to eye contact and to constant contact and to LinkedIn, for example, and maybe to Twitter and other environments, other clouds out there to stitch together a business solution that makes sense for you and for your company? So these are some issues to keep in mind, but cloud is here to stay. There's just no doubt about that. On-premise software is here to stay. So what we have to figure out in the enterprise or any even small to mid-sized business is how do you define your architecture and maintain it such that you can leverage cloud without creating a giant silo up somewhere else outside of your control. 
So obviously the whole data warehousing industry evolved around a need to consolidate critical information in order to analyze that information and make better decisions. Well, now Amazon Web Services has Redshift. In fact, one of the biggest webcasts we ever did was with Redshift. That's a pretty big deal. They're changing the dynamic. They're changing the pricing structures. You can watch as your pricing goes down on traditional enterprise software licensing, in part because of cloud computing, in part because these folks are out there lowering the price points, putting pressure on price. So that's good news for the end user. It's something to keep in mind, certainly for anyone out there who's trying to use some of these technologies. So it's something to keep in mind, and we'll talk about that today on the show. So analyst Dr. Robin Ballor is going to be our first analyst of the day. So I'm going to go ahead and push his first slide and hand the keys over to him. Robin, I think you're in here somewhere. There you are. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off, and the floor is yours. Okay, Eric. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I came across a, a couple of days ago. I came across a survey of consumers, in actual fact, uh, which asked the question: um, Do you think that um, stormy weather interferes with cloud computing? And more than 50% of them said yes. I just thought I would let you know that it doesn't. If you're one of those believers in that, and um, that's a bit like believing that you know when you've got snow on the television, it's because it's snowing outside. Um, cloud, you know, one of the things that's kind of, um, you know, uh, an important, if you like, simple detail of a, of the cloud is that, is that the cloud is actually a data center in one way or another, or any particular cloud service is a data center. Um, the only thing is it's a different data center than the traditional cloud. So I was going to talk an overview about the cloud, so that uh, Gilles Bear could to go into more detail about cloud usage because no point in us covering the same ground. Um, so the first kind of point that I, I'd, I'd like to make is that cloud's a service, you know, and one of the things that's actually happening because of cloud computing is that there's um, uh, what I call the death of brands, a whole a whole series of software brands that had an awful lot of power and continue to have power within corporate computing. Um, once you get into the cloud, they don't have much power anymore. You know, When you buy a cloud service, you care about the application, of course. You care about the service level that the cloud is going to give you. You don't want the, you don't want the cloud service failing frequently. Um, you care about the usage cost, and you care about those things because it's a service. But what you don't care about anymore you don't care what hardware it's running on particularly. You don't care what the networking technology is. You don't care what the operating system that's running is. You don't care what the file systems are. You don't even care what the database is unless actually you're specifically buying a given database service out of the cloud, you know? Um, and the impact of that, in a way, is that the cloud, uh, is that an awful lot of software brands have no real value in the cloud because you know, you're going to the cloud in one way or another for something that is a service and not anymore a product. Um, so I thought I'd get, do a couple of slides. Of reasons not to use the cloud, you know, and these are all, if you like, you know, very simple and obvious reasons, but somebody had to state them, so I thought I would. Um, reasons not to, meet, uh, not to use the cloud, if, if, they can't, if it can't provide the kind of data and process governance that you want, then, you know, it simply doesn't meet your criteria. If it can't give you the performance that you want, it's not going to meet your criteria. If it can't give you the flexibility in terms of how you can move stuff around, then it's not going to meet your criteria. And those are just obvious reasons why particular cloud services wouldn't suit an awful lot of people out there that are doing corporate computing. Um, you might not do it because you can do it cheaper. The cloud isn't always the cheapest option. Some people seem to think because it's often an inexpensive option, it's always going to be cheaper. It isn't always cheaper. And the other thing is that if, you know, if you're taking a, an application from the cloud and it doesn't integrate well with what you're doing, then you're probably not going to go forward with it. And those are you know, reasons to turn away. Here are the reasons to adopt. You know, one of the things that you can do in the cloud, pretty much bulletproof, is prototyping activity. If you, you know, you can prototype in the cloud and implement in the data center. Uh, it's entirely viable, and there's a vast amount of people doing that. 
you can offload work from a data center with non-critical applications because it will probably you'll be able to find some kind of cloud service that will meet your service levels for the non-critical stuff. Um, and you can offload specific applications like Salesforce.com and um, similar offerings to that. Uh, you know, the standard application, everybody kind of has uh, a capability in that area. And if yours isn't specialized, then, you know, the, the traditional whatever is available in the cloud is probably going to be what you go with. So the final thing that I wanted to say, and it's a kind of an interesting thing, really, is, is that when you actually look at the cloud, one way of understanding it is just as a series of economies of scale. The whole point is that, you know, they're running a data center out there, and you're going to dial into that data center in some way or other and use it. And therefore, it would be better, it would better be in the main cheaper than you could do it yourself. So, you know. It's really all about economies of scale. The cloud providers, they choose their data center location, and the best place to locate a data center is right next to a power station, uh, and especially right next to an inexpensive power station. So one uh, power station up north that happens to be hydroelectric or something like that, those are normally the cheapest, you know. You can actually locate the dentist data center there, and you will find it's easier. Um, it's it, it's um, less expensive to hire people in such locations than it is in the center of New York or San Francisco. You can standardize on the whole facility in terms of air conditioning and power. That will save you a lot because it means you know you can devote a whole building to it, and that's what exactly what the cloud operators do. They standardize on networking hardware. They standardize on the computer hardware they use, normally com uh, commodity x86 boards. Uh, often they'll assemble them themselves. Um, so some are even actually building the whole thing up. Um, they'll use open source software whenever they can because there's absolutely no cost to adopting it. They'll standardize on all software, so they'll never upgrade anything except to upgrade it all at once. Um, they'll uh, organize their own support, so they'll be paying support to multitude of different providers. They'll just have their own support facility. Um, they'll have scale-up and scale-out capability in the sense that they'll be running more than you would ever be running of that kind of service. And they will monitor their usage in, in a way that most data centers can't because they're kind of running only one standardized service, but most data centers are running a whole series of things. And that's what the cloud's all about, really. And uh, and that, in a, in a certain way, can define whether it interests you or whether it doesn't for um, uh, any particular area of application. So, you know, my kind of rough rule of thumb is that where economies of scale are possible, uh, the cloud's going to take over sooner or later. But where innovation and um, flexibility and a very specific thing that you built yourself um, really counts, the cloud's always going to be second best. Okay, let me um, pass it back to Eric or on to Gilbert. Okay, and Gilbert, I'll give you the keys here to the WebEx. Stand by. Just click anywhere on that slide and use the down arrow on your keyboard. I think I am in control. <laughs> you are in control. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, the cloud imperative, the sky is the limit. Is it an urban legend or what would you think? Mother wait. Uh, these are just a few thoughts and things to consider. First, on the what front, uh, you know, as uh, as we all know, I don't think anyone is doubting this. Sassification um, is here to stay um, because good software actually never dies; it merely moves to the cloud, right? I think I've said this before in a previous edition of this. Oh no, or Eric said that for me in a previous edition. And I think the obvious reason, and um, this goes back to Robin in a way as well, is that um, on the corporate side of things, the corporate timeline is pretty easy. The CMO always needs it all, and he needs it now. So he's all about time to market. So SaaS is a good excuse for that in a way for him. The CIO, however, is a little nervous about SaaS and clouds because, you know, the, old, the whole elasticity problem means that what goes up must also come down. You must be ready to scale out, but also to scale back. So he's a little nervous about that. The CFO is not nervous 
not more than than usual, but he goes like, hey, hey, this is how much will this set us back? It's the you know the infamous uh, capital expenditure versus uh, opex discussion. It's it's pretty old, but it's very uh, you know very important in this world. And then last but not least, the CEO, of course, he goes like, oh, risk mitigation, guys. Um, you guys are all excited, but are we ready for this? Because risk is what he thinks about. So, what is the risk? Just a few thoughts, right? We are dealing here with thought leadership, but in an unfinished path. Because this is all pretty new stuff. All, pre all fairly recent stuff. We don't have a lot of data points, um, really, if you think about it. And so um, we also, on the risk side, have to deal with onboarding. You know, people sign an agreement, go like, yes, that is what we want, the way to go. They sign up, but then that, that, that's not enough. Um, you know, you have to onboard people. And that, remember the movie Stuck in Translation? That's a little bit of, you know, what onboarding is all about. And then also, as Robin just said, um, you know, on-prem is not necessarily going away right away. So you have to integrate both worlds. Uh, it's a hybrid world. And so how are you going to do that? Is 80-20, the 80-20 rule, Pareto, is that okay? Is that good enough? Mm, and then the garbage in, garbage out when you connect two systems, is that okay? Is that doable? Because, you know, are you going to migrate? Are you going to map your enterprise to the new system? How are you going to do that? And then the last one, which I think is extremely important, um, is multi-tenant architectures, meaning that data privacy, own your own data, sometimes it's called own your own data, becomes very important. You know, 100 people using the same system, one database sits below the system, who's going to see my data? Just me, right? Are you absolutely sure about that? Data privacy, data security, hot topics. But if you're the CIO, it brings back the I in the CIO, because now you're in charge of information. That's pretty interesting if you are the CIO. So let's talk a little bit about the why. So the strategic intent of all of this is very, very simple, I think. If you are a subscriber, there is market pressure. If you are a provider, there is competitive pressure. Uh, your peers, there is peer pressure. If you're a subscriber, it's just market psychology. Everybody wants to go to the cloud. SaaS, or whatever you call it, cloud SaaS, we all need and want to go there. And the reason is usually financial. That's the obvious reason. But if you think about the financial aspect, you get into what I call the bill versus budget paradox. Are you going to go for a subscription, or you can eat system, $50, $500 a month, or something like that? Or do you dream about usage-based so that you only pay for what you really use? And so how is that going to work, usage-based, consumption-based? How are you going to meter all that stuff? It's probably not going to happen right away, so you will end up with a hybrid uh, mechanism, which is I pay 200 a month and maybe occasionally 500 because I have to pay for the, for the extra consumption. Retainer plus is probably going to be, in my opinion, the way to go. But there is also something that I call the hidden intent on the Y front, and I believe that, you know, this is absolutely real. It's the change of control. It's the CIO versus the CMO. The power shift or the power struggle between the CMO, I want it all and I want it now, and the CIO who says like, hey, this is all about data. You know, I used to run 20 years ago, it was all about hardware systems. Ten years ago, it was all about applications. Today, it's all about the data. And since I am the CIO, information, it's all about me. I am in control. So that is kind of the power shift or power struggle, I believe, that is going on right now between these two, the CMO and the CIO. So in the end, this is all so young that Nobody really knows if we are in the innovator type environment or in the early adopter type environment. I believe we are in the early adopter environment, not the early majority, just the early adopter, but, you know, kind of halfway. And so, you know, for the customer, the end user, the subscriber, this is about getting a head start because the CMO wants the head start, right? 
And so it's important to not end up with what we call diminishing returns. The limiting head start might lead to diminishing returns. That's why it's extremely important to uh, you know, find trusted parties that can make sure that single point of failure is not an issue and that data security is respected. So it will require quite a bit of change management. And so in the end, almost done, this is the last slide. Um, how are we going to do this? How is the move to the cloud, the move to SaaS going to be you know, seamless and easy? Well, by doing two things, paying attention, provisioning, really important, and onboarding, even more important. All right, fantastic. And in that case, the sky is the limit. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. I love the very provocative ideas. I like that we kind of broke all that down. I think that makes a lot of sense. And let's go ahead and push Ashish's first slide, and I will hand the keys to the WebEx over to you. Ashish, okay, go ahead. Uh, just click anywhere on that slide and use the down arrow on your keyboard. There you go. All right, thanks, Eric. Um, hi, folks, this is Ashish, and I'm going to be telling you about Kubol. Uh, so uh, just to start off, Kubol essentially provides a, a big data as a service platform. It's a cloud-based platform uh, hosted in the Amazon Cloud and uh, the Google Cloud. And uh, we provide technologies such as Hadoop, Hive, uh, Presto, and a bunch of others, which I'll talk about, uh, all in a turnkey manner so that uh, uh, our clients can essentially uh, get out of all the confusion uh, in the big data infrastructure world or uh, get out of actually running and operating this infrastructure and really focus more on their, uh, on the, on their data and the transformations that they want to do on their data. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what uh, Kubol is all about. Um, in terms of the tangible benefits, uh, one way of thinking about Kubol, uh, you know, of course it's a turnkey uh, self-service platform for uh, uh, for big data analysis and big data integration built around Hadoop. Uh, but more fundamentally, what it does is that, uh, you know, for all the big data engines, uh, such as Hadoop, Hive, Presto, uh, Spark, Shortly, and so on and so forth, it brings all the benefits of, uh, of the cloud uh, to these big data engines. And some of the key benefits that it brings uh, from the cloud's perspective is, um, you know, making infrastructure adaptive and uh, adaptive by, by adaptive, I mean both agile as well as flexible uh, to the workloads uh, being run on any of these engines, and also making these engines that much more self-service and uh, collaborative in the sense that um, uh, you know, Kubol provides interfaces where uh, you can de uh, use these uh, particular technologies not just for your development or you know, developer-oriented tasks, but even your other data and this can also start getting the benefits of these technologies through a self-service interface. Um, we get a lot, uh, you know, pertaining to this particular, uh, you know, webinar, uh, you know, uh, th this is one of our perspectives as to what uh, benefits of the cloud that Kubol brings to big data. So if you just do a comparison between uh, how you run, say, Hadoop and related workloads uh, in an on-prem setting, uh, in an on-prem setting, you're always thinking in terms of static clusters. You know, you fix your clusters, uh, you uh, maybe size them uh, to your peak uh, usage, and you keep them there, and uh, then if you have to change them, then you have to go through a whole process um, of procurement, of deployment, of testing, and so on and so forth. Kubol changes that by creating clusters completely on demand. Uh, our clusters are completely elastic. We use the object stores in the cloud to actually store data, and our clusters come up and, uh, you know, they come up on the basis of the demand being generated by the users, and they go away when there is no demand. So this makes that infrastructure that much more uh, agile and flexible and adaptive to your workloads. Another example of flexibility is, you know, today you might have created your static clusters, you know, with a certain workload in mind, and if your workloads change and your infrastructure now needs to be upgraded, maybe you need more uh, memory on, on your machines and things like that. Again, uh, you know, doing this on the cloud, so Kubol, for example, makes that brain dead simple. Uh, you can always rent new different types of machines uh, and, you know, get clusters, 100 node clusters up and running in a couple of minutes as opposed to uh, weeks that you have to wait on uh, for on-prem Hadoop. The other key thing that uh, in, in which uh, Kubol differentiates itself from on-prem is that Kubol is essentially as a service offering. So all the tools and the infrastructure that you need are pre-integrated into the service. 
uh, you don't have to, whereas an on-prem, you know, it's primarily you take the software, you have to run it yourself, uh, you have to integrate it yourself and do those all those uh, benefits, all the benefits of SaaS uh, model uh, accrue to, uh, you know, how Kubel offers uh, big data uh, as opposed to trying to run Hadoop on-prem by yourself. Um, this slide generally covers uh, our architecture. We are, of course, based on uh, on the cloud. We store our data on object store in the cloud, whether it's in the cloud, uh, Google Cloud, com uh, and, and Google Compute Engine, or Amazon Web Services. We take all the Hadoop ecosystem projects, and around that, we have developed key IP around auto scaling and self management. We've done a lot of cloud optimizations to make these component technologies work really well in the cloud. As you know, cloud infrastructure is very different. Uh, from on uh, from just running things on bare metal, and a whole bunch of data connectors to enable uh, data to be moved in and out of this platform. So that comprises of a cloud platform, and that enables uh, uh, that is you know that is a key the key feature there is how to make all the self service so that you don't have to have a strong uh, you don't ha have a very large operational footprint while running this. But we tie that along with our data workbench, whether these are tools for analysts. Uh, whether these are data governance tools, whether these are um, templating tools, and so on and so forth, so that you can bring the benefits of this technology not just to the developers but other business users in the enterprise as well. And of course, uh, we tie in also this uh, cloud platform to uh, tools that these folks might already be using, whether these are you know visualization tools such as Tableau, uh, or uh, whether they are using uh, you know more um, uh, you know data warehousing uh, top, uh, type of products like Redshift and so on and so forth. Um, today, the service is running at a fairly large scale. Uh, we process actually uh, close to 40 petabytes of data every month now um, across our client base. Uh, our clusters vary in size from 10 node clusters to 1,500 node clusters. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the range of scale that we can uh, process. And by and large, to the best of my knowledge, we run probably some of the largest clusters on the cloud as far as Hadoop is concerned. And we process through around 250,000 virtual machines in a single month across our clusters. Remember, our model is clusters on demand, uh, which has tremendous benefits in terms of reducing your operational workloads as well as improving your TCO and so on and so forth. Finally, uh, you know, one of our, uh, you know, this is just a sampling of how Kubel has been transformative to various companies. Uh, Pinterest is an example of our client. Um, they were, they were already on the cloud. They were running uh, uh, Elastic MapReduce on the cloud, for example, um, and the data usage there was fairly constrained. They would have about 30 or 30 odd users who could use that technology. With Kubel, they have been able to expand that to more than 200 uh, odd users in the uh, company which has seen expansion of uh, big data use cases uh, and uh, it's really brought uh, you know what we call the definition of an agile big data platform uh, and that it's become really central uh, to a lot of their analytics workloads um, so just to close out uh, you know that was a brief primer on Kubel. Uh, essentially our vision is how we make enterprises that much more agile around big data and uh, essentially, we leverage uh, the benefits of the cloud and bring them uh, to bear on big data technologies around Hadoop uh, so that uh, our clients can leverage uh, those benefits of agility and those benefits of flexibility uh, and those benefits of self-service nature of the cloud uh, to become that much more effective with their data needs. Uh, so I'll uh, stop there and hand it over back to Eric. All right, that sounds great. And now I'll hand it over to Mike Miller of Cloudit. Mike, I'm passing you the keys right now. Just click anywhere on that slide. There you go. Take All it away. Right. Looks, looks like I have the keys. Um, so I'll apologize. I lost, uh, I think I forgot to ship some fonts with my presentation. Uh, so hopefully you can look past that and match that. Everything <laughs> That's okay. Beautiful. Um, but I, yeah, uh, this is fun. I've got a long list here of uh, provocative things that I heard that I wrote down that I'm eager to return to in the panel. So I'll try to get through this quickly. Um, so I'm going to talk about Cloudant. Cloudant is a, a database as a service. Uh, we're a cloud provider, uh, and actually I, I don't even have the new logo. We were acquired by IBM uh, not too long ago. And so we're, um, I'm going to talk about um, our service and in particular focus on trying to make our users and customers agile in a slightly different way than the previous speaker. 
Um, Cloudant provides a database uh, as a service and other data-related services for people that build applications. So we engage directly with developers and we focus on operational or OLTP data in contrast to the analytics um, that we heard from uh, Ashish previously. Um, and the point there, really, Cloudant's entire value pitch can be broken down into helping our users do more, and so that's build more apps, uh, grow more, and sleep more. I'll talk about that in a little bit of detail, but the general idea here is that if you're a user, uh, you know, you're in a business, either enterprise, building a new application, adding a feature to an existing application, or a web and mobile startup, you should be focusing on your core competency. And previously, maybe up to a decade ago, IT could be a distinguishing, you know, um, competition, uh, sorry, competitive advantage, uh, even running a database well could be a competitive advantage, and we think that those days are over. And so uh, the way we really try to work with our, our users is to encourage them to use composite services, modular, reusable, composable, with the idea being that that reduces time to market and increases scalability. And the overall idea here is that cloud is not just, you know, something new being pushed onto users. It's really a market, um, it's a market uh, evolution. Uh, because the way people build applications, consume applications, uh, the devices on which they're running, and the scale of data has changed pretty radically in the last uh, five to ten years. And that's really stressed the existing application architecture uh, for building apps, as well as just dealing with that data and analytics workloads um, offline. And so that opens up a whole uh, stream of opportunity. So Cloudin is a distributed database as a service, um, and it was unique, uh, I, I believe, in, in its inception that it really shipped with a mobile strategy from the beginning, and I'll talk about it in some detail. But the idea is that uh, writing applications now, you're not writing for just a single platform, right? You're writing for something that can run at petabyte scale in the cloud. It also has to be able to um, run smoothly on a desktop or in a browser. And more and more, we're seeing things um, we're having to run on a mobile device or a semi-connected device, a wearable device, or something moving towards IoT. And so I think that you know applications that can deal well and leverage those different um, those different uh, clients um, are incredibly competitive in the market. Um, and what we try to do is make it simple for people to use a single API uh, and a single programming model to write uh, handle data in all of those different. Um, devices at vastly different scale. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, uh, initial uptake in web and mobile um, is, is where we saw our biggest traction, but even now, uh, before the acquisition, we're seeing a larger and larger number of enterprise users, even in things uh, as, uh, what would I say, as conservative as uh, Fidelity Investments, right, working with a virtual, uh, building a, a virtual uh, safe deposit box. So I think that the, this market has actually taken off much faster than even we had expected. Um, I'll just talk about uh, cloud in a little bit more and then turn it over. The, the idea here is that we really make it easier for you to build more and use a service like cloud and to store the data, the state of your application, and then move that to your different devices and keep things in sync. Um, in stark contrast to how you would build an application, a traditional stack where you have to buy servers like we heard about before, um, where you have to provision those, install, license things. With Cloudant, we try to make it easy. All the data that you'll need, all the search services, database, et cetera, for your application can be acquired by signing up and getting a single endpoint URL and then starting to use that URL. The idea being that that is a service uh, that uses a, multiple, uh, a mix of multiple technologies underneath, some proprietary, many open source, but we use them together in a way that the end developer or product team needs to build something. Um, and so database now looks very different uh, than they did at uh, inception, where you would have you know rows and columns to store business ledgers. Um, now we need to store JSON documents. That generally happens over HTTP or using existing open source APIs. And then in cloud, we give you the things that a database should do, like a primary index and secondary indexes for you know retrieval and OLTP um, and, and driving application logic. But in addition, there's a wide range of things like search geospatial, um, and replication between devices um, that are very important. So that's all provided underneath our API. But the really distinguishing thing that allows our users to grow, and for instance why Samsung was one of our earliest and biggest customers, is that you know, Cloudant now is uh, underneath uh, the notion of clusters. Each cluster is shared nothing architecture of three to hundreds of nodes. Um, but we run those in over 35 data centers now globally so that there is always a place for you to store your data within a millisecond of any other cloud provider or most existing data centers. So 
Now, one of the big early uh, things that was challenging uh, in the cloud was, well, if, how do I split a hybrid architecture where my application servers may be here and my database servers may be someplace else? That would never work. They have to be on the same machine or in the same place. Well, the reality now is that by cobbling together different cloud providers, and this is something that we still do as, as an IBM company, you can make sure that your database is always within a millisecond of any other place. And we take care of the peering agreements and just take bandwidth costs off the table, something that people would worry about. So Cloudin is really a database as a service, but you can think of it more like a, a CDN, like Akamai for your database for, for data that changes you know, on millisecond time scale. And really finally, um, I think a major selling point is if you build an application that's successful, um, you have to decide as an organization whether or not you, you want to then grow the 24 by 7, 365 globally distributed you know, operation team that it takes to run that at the, the large scales or whether that's something that now is commoditized as well. And so we focus very heavily on helping onboard uh, new users and new customers and help them make the jump to the cloud and, and build architectures that use cloud and as well as other things in a very coherent and scalable way so that in the end, uh, you, you know, our users can focus on building applications and not on, on surviving their own success. And with that, uh, I'll just say thanks, skip over some slides that were skipped, and I'll turn it back over to Lawrence. That is fantastic. So, Lawrence, let me hand you the keys to the WebEx here. Just give me one second. There you are. Keys being transferred. Just click anywhere on that slide and use the down arrow. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the handover, and uh, you know, thanks to all the presenters today. Nice way to set everything up, and uh, definitely be a lot of uh, things to talk about as I uh, after I get through with the uh, presentation here. So. Um, Again, I'm Lauren Schwartz. I uh, run marketing over at Attunity, and uh, you know, I wanted to talk about some of the uh, issues that we see and, and some of the challenges uh, in the space that we're in. So, a quick uh, overview and introduction to Attunity as a company and who we are. Um, we focus on moving data, so we talk about moving any type of data, uh, anytime, anywhere, um, and enabling that for users. Uh, we're a public company based uh, out of the Boston area or near Boston. And uh, when we talk about the cloud, uh, we have some uh, uh, great relationships. Um, we're part of the, uh, the AWS network as a big data integration partner um, and have been close to them since uh, the launch of their Redshift and even working with them before that. Um, we've gotten some nice recognition for the work that we've done. Um, and as a company, we're in over uh, 2,000 uh, places use Attunity and we're in half of the Fortune 100 companies, so we've gotten some good experiences. As you can see on, on kind of the bottom of the slide here, uh, a big issue is you've got data that's generated from all different types of sources these days, uh, from traditional uh, you know, CRM systems, all different places on the Internet, um, all the, the different places where data could start, and then it has to go to uh, places to be analyzed, to be worked with, and to uh, be looked at. Um, and we focus on, you know, getting the data, you know, where it needs to be. So I'm going to talk about our solutions that we do specifically on the cloud. And when you think about that, uh, oftentimes the data um, rests somewhere uh, on premise. So besides having a relationship with places like Amazon, we have uh, very close working relationships with places like Teradata, Oracle, uh, Vertica, Pivotal, and Microsoft, all the places where uh, data traditionally uh, uh, exists today on, on premise. Um, so when you think about this, and you know, and um, uh, I think it was Eric who um, you know talked about uh, onboarding uh, is, is key to the whole process, right? Um, and thinking about the issues uh, to getting data on on a system. Um, you know, where do some of the bottlenecks uh, exist today? And when you look at uh, people moving data into a data warehouse or database and into the cloud, you can see a lot of time is spent on what's called the ETL process, the extract, transformation, and loading of the data from where it resides to where it needs to go. Uh, and if you think about getting the value out of data, that's not where you want to be spending your time and efforts. That's not the, the most uh, productive area for a data scientist. Um, and the flip side to that is there's very few people who are very satisfied with that process. It's, you know, less than 20% uh, really find that to be a, a good process. So there's a real kind of pain point bottleneck, if you will, uh, in getting to the cloud and doing that type of onboarding that people need to do. And there's even, you know, real performance issues. Um, you know, you could look at how do you get stuff into the cloud. And if you want to get, um, you know, a couple of terabytes into the cloud, you could certainly ship it to the cloud, and there are still places that do that with large data sets. 
um, or a lot of the traditional methods just don't have the performance to get there. It could take days to do that. So there's a real, you know, pain point uh, in, in the marketplace um, as people think about how do they get and how do they move on to the cloud. So if we step back and, uh, and, and look at what that means and why that's there and, and you know, how this has come about, you know, both, both Eric and Gilbert talked about the fact that, you know, the data that's on there today, that exists today, you know, on-premise is here to stay, um, you know, cloud is here to stay, so that integration becomes all the more important. And oftentimes people fall back on the tools that they have to, to move over data. Again, there's a lot of ETL or traditional tools out there to kind of move data over in batches. But there's a lot of issues with that. Uh, people find that traditional ways of moving data are, are very time and resource intensive to set up. They often require a lot of scripting, even if they're autonomous in some way, a lot of people, a lot of manpower. There's so many sources and targets, particularly on-premise today, to move it into the cloud. You know, all the systems I mentioned earlier, Oracle, Microsoft, Teradata, so managing that whole part of it. Um, and then, you know, looking at the performance as it moves over, being able to have the tools to make sure everything is moving quickly, that, that a lot of uh, systems that uh, exist today aren't well built for that. Uh, and then lastly, a lot of the way people think about moving data is kind of done in a batch process. And if you're thinking about trying to do more near real time, that's not the most effective way. It kind of gives you stale data that, that's not as interesting to the organization. So when you look at uh, what Attunity does in this space and, and how we think about it, it's, it's a different architecture that, that we're focused on. We've really built this from the ground up and thought about when you have to go from some type of source database out to the cloud, how do you make sure that it's very easy and straightforward to do? So that requires rethinking how you do the monitoring and kind of set up for it. It's making the whole thing just kind of a couple of clicks to get started. It's really thinking about the movement and optimizing the performance over the channel and, and working with just a wide variety of platforms because a lot of bigger organizations kind of have a best of breed approach, have a lot of different types of databases or data warehouses already in their environment. So you have to think about it differently. You can't just do an extract, you know, dump the data out, do some sort of transformation, load it somewhere. Uh, you have to kind of think about the architecture, change how you do the processing, do it more in memory, and focus on a, on a more performant version. Um, so what does that mean, and, and what does that look like? So one key tenant to uh, get to the promise of the cloud is things have to be easier to set up. Um, you know, that screen there is just some screenshots from, from how we do it, but it's, you know, one, two, three, kind of pick your source and target, pick what you want to do, do you want to do one-time move or CDC, and then just go. It, it, it needs to be no harder than that. Um, you know, I know we just, uh, you know, saw the, uh, the presentation from Mike, and he talked about how easy it was for people to get started with, uh, with cloud. And same type of thing, you have to be able to kind of get going in a few steps, otherwise uh, you start losing the value of it. Um, when you think about um, the, the monitoring and control of it, um, there are some great companies out there, places I know you're all familiar with, like Tableau and others who have done a great job of visualizing the end product of data um, and how to do it. But, um, you know, being able to visualize the movement process, the management of it, where does the data sit uh, on premise in the cloud, is it moving over, is there a lag, is there a latency, having that viewpoint is, is critical and that's an important part of moving forward. Uh, another aspect that becomes important is the performance. Um, you can't just rely on the standard FTP kind of two-way protocols that people have been using for years. As you move more and more data over, you have to have optimized uh, file channel protocols that are geared towards, you know, more um, you know, one-directional movement most of the time. You have to rethink about how you break up tables and, and shift them out and move them over. Um, and you have to give people the flexibility to do that. Otherwise, you can't get it there in time. And, and um, if you do that differently and think about it differently, you can get a 10x performance, um, but you have to rethink the technology. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you've got a lot of different places that data re uh, exists today. So you've got to be able to, to work with all those and, and offer the widest kind of amount of support so that people can, can get onto the cloud. Um, so what does that mean for, for users? And, and I'll just wrap this up with, uh, you know, one or two kind of quick uh, cases of how people have had challenges getting to the cloud, see the value, but then are able to do that if they have the right tool set. So one company uh, that we work with, eTix, they do online uh, uh, ticketing, um, major provider in this space. 
Um, and uh, I know Robin talked about data center offload as kind of a key use case for the cloud. This is exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to load and sync their data from Oracle on-premise to Redshift and do that in a timely uh, uh, fashion. Um, and the interesting thing is, you know, to go back to what Gilbert said, you know, it's you really talked about onboarding being an issue. They could see the print, the value of Redshift. They could see the cost savings. They could see all the advanced analytics. They could quickly start doing that they couldn't do before. They knew that value, but there was a roadblock to getting there. Uh, in this case, they, they looked at it and said, well, I see the value of Redshift, but it was going to take them, you know, three months of development effort and time and, you know, maybe hiring a DBA and doing all this extra work uh, to get there. So there is a real block in the path to, to do it. Uh, once you have the right tool sets and data integration capabilities to do that, they were able to go down from, you know, months of planning to literally just get going in minutes. And that's, again, lowering that barrier and getting people onto the cloud. Um, you need to have the right capabilities to, to, to deliver on the promise. Um, the uh, the last, uh, you know, uh, slide I have here and kind of uh, another use case is, um, you know, we work with other companies. Uh, Philips, uh, you know, well-known in many spaces. We work with their healthcare division. Um, and, again, they, they were trying to go from an on-premise source uh, over to Redshift, in this case, SQL Server. Um, and they knew the value. They knew all the analytics they could do on it um, and, and, and had done some testing on it. Um, but they saw that without having the right tools, this was something that was going to take them, you know, weeks. And they had been spending, actually, weeks spinning their wheels and trying to get things moved over. Once uh, they had the right tool set to simplify it, get it moved over quickly, um, they were able to go down and start loading in less than an hour, you know, over 30 million records. So the load time went from a couple of months to, to about two hours for them. And then they were able to do the things that they wanted to do. They didn't have to focus on the, the data loading. They could focus on the operational support. They got much better metrics for quality of care, cost, and operations. Um, so when you think about the whole challenge, you know, we reside in that space of enabling the, the data movement. And um, now more than ever with the cloud, when you think of it being kind of a remote place to stick your data, um, you know, this becomes uh, an area that, um, you know, more and more people need to solve to, to take advantage of what's out there. Um, so that's an overview of, of what we do. And um, with that, I will uh, pass it back to you, Eric. Okay, that sounds great. We've got a good amount of time here. We'll go a bit long to get to some good questions, folks, but feel free to send your questions. And I know I've got a few questions myself. Um, Lawrence, I guess I'll start off with you. You, know, you guys have been in the space of kind of supercharging the movement of data for a while. And yeah, I've been watching the cloud very carefully and I've really been kind of surprised at how long it's taken major enterprises, Fortune 1000 companies, to fully embrace cloud. I mean, there are, of course, pockets of severe interest, let's call it, in large organizations. But as a general rule, there's been a bit of a reluctance that is only starting to wane in the last year or so, at least from my perspective. But what do you see out there in terms of cloud adoption and, and readiness of the enterprise to use cloud computing? Uh, sure. I, I think uh, you're right. It has been a, uh, a significant uh, uh, change, um, and, um, and it's certainly taken time. You know, they, they have that joke about, um, you know, the successful, you know, the overnight sensation that really, uh, or overnight success that really takes years in the making, and that's been true for the cloud, right? It's, it's, you've seen that, that tick in the last uh, year, but it's due to all the hard work of a lot of players like Amazon, who's been doing this for years. You know, to get the services out there to kind of, you know, prove the, the metal when there's, you know, failures and problems, to give the diversity and flexibility that they have uh, that, that things like Redshift offer. So I think the maturity has gotten there, the, the confidence has gotten there. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, I think it's infiltrated into a lot of companies uh, through small areas, you know, small use cases, small trials, kind of outside that center IT control. And is that, uh, you know, as those successful kind of periphery projects have proven out, um, there's, you know, more of a willingness to have the conversations about how that, uh, how that spread. Um, and frankly, you know, there's been additional tools that have, um, you know, have also uh, come out there to make this easier, uh, like what we do and, and others that um, not just move the data, but, but show the value of, like, BI in the cloud and showing that. So um, it's, uh, in one way, it's an it's a overnight or a big uptick in the last year, but a big part of that's been all the hard work uh, leading up to that. So now we as a company see uh, a lot more adoption um, it's, as a business for what we do. 
uh, it's grown uh, quite a bit. And uh, cloud, um, you know, because we do a lot of on-premise to on-premise movement, now cloud shows up in, in a lot of the conversations as, you know, real business cases, real offloading cases, uh, whereas a year ago it was certainly, you know, just more exploratory. Now they've got real projects to move. So uh, it's been nice to see that movement. Okay, great. And Mike Miller, you had mentioned that uh, you heard a couple of provocative statements you wanted to comment on. So uh, by all means, uh, what, what, what did you find sure. interesting or what do you want to talk about? Well, I think Robin, uh, he, he made a point in his second to last slide uh, contrasting where, where innovation counts. The cloud will always be second best. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because in my mind, if I was thinking about building, you know, an application or or some new uh, some new service, um, it's hard for me to think that my organization, no matter what they are, really wants to go engineer to engineer with Google, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft. So I, I, I think maybe I misunderstood his point with that. Interesting, Robin. Uh, Mike's throwing down the gauntlet. What do you think? <laughs> Well, I mean, the point here is uh, there are a number of situations that I've come across which are um, where people have gone into the cloud and walked back out, and the reason that they walked back out was, you know, when it came to actually having, and mostly this was performance-driven, but the performance was actually the crux um, of the application that was being built. If they couldn't get the low latency they wanted, then the cloud was no use to them. And, you know, and the, the situation was that, you know, actually going into the cloud, even if they were given the ability to measure behavior of the networks within the cloud, the network um, loads in the cloud was something they had absolutely no control over. And because of that, they couldn't create the tailor-made services that they were looking for. And that's a, a performance edge. I don't think there's anything in terms of, um, uh, you know, coding that's go uh, going to be constricted to what you can do in the cloud. It's service level that's a constriction, and if that's part of um, where your um, uh, critical uh, capability is going to be, then the cloud's not going to be able to deliver it. I see. Um, so I appreciate that clarification. I, I do agree, actually, that transparency is one of the big uh, things that we here um, as a desire, right, um, from users uh, across many different providers. Um, so I think you raise a very fair point. When it comes to performance, I, th I think that traditionally it has been very hard to, you know, to go to a cloud provider or any given cloud provider and find exactly the hardware you're looking for. But I will note in kind of the, the upping the ante and the race to, to, the, to basically free storage between Google and Amazon and, and other competitors, that it is interesting to see the pressure that puts on driving down the cost of SSD, flash, et cetera. So I think that's a fun one to watch going forward. Oh, I think no, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that one of the things that's actually happening is that a second wave is coming along. The first wave was this, you know, this wonderfully tailored um, service. As long as, you know, it was a, it's a little bit um, Henry Ford. You can have every color as long as it's black. But but, you know, even so, extreme reduction in certain kinds of costs that you have in the data center. Well, the second thing that happens is having actually built these huge data centers out, they start, these cloud operators suddenly start discovering things that you can actually do that you couldn't do before because you didn't have the scale. So there is, I think, a second wave which, um, to a certain extent, is going to make the cloud even more appealing. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And let me go ahead and bring... Ashish, and I'm going to go ahead and throw up your uh, your architecture slide here. We always love these kind of architecture slides to help people wrap their heads around what's going on. I guess one thing that just jumps out at me is, of course, yarn. We talked about that on yesterday's briefing room. Yarn is not a small deal. For those of you who aren't familiar with this concept, it is yet another resource negotiator. It's really it's very interesting development because what happened is in the Hadoop movement, yarn is kind of replacing the engine, really, if you will. Uh, our speaker from yesterday referred to it as the operating system. It's like the new operating system of Hadoop, which of course consists of the highly distributed file system underneath, which, can, which is basically storage when you get right down to it. And then MapReduce is what we, you used to have to use to use HDFS. And MapReduce is a fairly constraining environment in terms of how you get things done. So the purpose of YARN was to make HDFS much more accessible and make the entire Hadoop ecosystem much more flexible and agile. So Ashish, I'll just kind of ask you in general, uh, since you're mentioning YARN here, I'm guessing that you guys are YARN compliant or certified. Can you kind of talk about what, how you see that change in the game for Hadoop and big data? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So I think, um, uh, you know, 
there are two parts to uh, so let me first uh, talk about you know why uh, yarn was done and uh, then uh, talk about how that potentially changes the game and what uh, fundamentally still stays the same you know where it doesn't change the game i think that's an important thing to realize also uh, because many times you you know you get caught up in this hype of hey this is a new shiny thing and you know uh, you know everything is going to you know all the problems are going to go away and so on and so forth <laughs> right. um so but the so the, the primary thing is that uh, you know the the strength and the weakness of the mapreduce api was that it is a very simple api and essentially any problem that you could um, structure around being a sorting problem could be represented in uh, you know that uh, api and some uh, some problems are uh, naturally uh, you know uh, uh, can naturally be transformed into that and some problems you know you sort of you know once you have just mapreduce at your uh, disposal then you try to fit it into a sorting problem so i think the latter is where uh, yarn plays a role by expanding out uh, those apis by you know uh, being able to compose uh, you know um, you know map uh, maps and uh, you know maps and reductions and uh, you know a whole bunch of different types of apis in terms of how uh the data can be distributed between these two stages and so on and so forth you just uh, make that api that much more richer so now you have at your disposal different ways of solving that same problem right so you just don't have to uh, you know be constrained by uh, the api and uh the problem gets solved one way or the other like you know if you're you know trying to do an analytics uh, uh um, you know workload uh, you can express that in mapreduce you can express that in yarn the big difference that happens uh, that starts to happen is uh, you know in terms of uh, you know the performance metrics that you start seeing um, uh, you know once you start uh, say programming to yarn and in some cases a uh, newer set of things for example streaming analysis and so on and so forth become starts becoming a reality when you start uh, you know doing that uh, uh, you know those things in yarn uh, so those are the differences that uh, you know that thing has brought in uh, into uh, the ecosystem i think it's much uh, the the richness there is much more on the api side as opposed to just it being uh, uh, another resource manager especially in the cloud context if you think about in cloud cloud context uh, the resor- resource manager is actually your uh, the vms that you bring up you know you have virtu- you know it's it's not necessarily and again this is a big difference between say on prem how you're running hadoop clusters and how you're running in Uh, in the cloud when you know you have like a, a constrained uh, static set of machines you want to distribute those machines amongst different resources and there's a use for yarn there but in the cloud uh, you know uh, you can bring up machines left and right and uh, so just from the perspective of being a resource manager it probably doesn't have that uh, you know that big a need in specifically in the cloud but from the perspective of providing these uh, you know richness of apis which allow you to for example with the hive days initiative they can now program uh, hive to not just use mapreduce but have much more um, richer plans of doing uh, jobs and things like that it brings those benefits uh, to the ecosystem i think that is where the true value of uh, yarn uh, belongs uh and uh, in the cloud context definitely uh, it's not that interesting from the resource management point of view but it's much more interesting in terms of what it enables uh, other projects to do in terms of uh, you know workloads that now it now can be used uh, to be programmed onto your data or uh, the previous workloads that can be done in a much more efficient way right um i had uh, you know one more uh, just uh, you know adding to mike you know there was another provocative thing uh, which was said which is around uh, and uh, you know uh, which is around hey treating the cloud as yet another data center uh, i think uh, you uh, you know that is one point of view which most uh, companies uh, you know look at and say okay you know that's the easiest point of view actually to look at saying that okay you know this is you have a bunch of machines on your you have you know you have uh, you have compute you have storage and you have uh, networking on your on prem data center and and cloud provides the same thing out there so i'll just go and do exactly the same thing that i'm doing on my on prem data center and do the same thing uh, in the cloud and pola that's uh, that's how it should work uh, what we have found out you know having been running in the cloud for the true clouds where you know you have ability to provision vms within a minute ability to uh, use a highly scalable object store to store data and things like that 
we have found that cloud actually the cloud architecture uh, and these inherent abilities actually enable different ways of doing things yeah, you know and uh, this is what i talked about in my slide as well uh, you know uh, this, the whole notion of a in, in just uh, you know in from the perspective of just Hadoop, the whole notion of just running a static cluster versus on-demand dynamic clusters, that is something that you don't see happening uh, in an on-prem data center, um, uh, you know, versus uh, uh, versus you know a true cloud where the you know there's a, enough capacity uh, to be able to support these types of workloads. And so I think there is definitely some shift uh, needed. Uh, you know, the, the big fear for me is that if you just treat cloud as yet another data center, you actually, uh, uh, while you, you know, there, there are a lot of other benefits, but there are a lot of uh, intrinsic benefits that you might ignore uh, if you, you know, start doing uh, that. Security is another one. The way you deal with security on the cloud, uh, there's a lot of differences in terms of how you would deal with, um, you know, in... Uh, 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 from an on-prem perspective and so on. So I just wanted to add that in um, from my perspective. Sure. Yeah, no, no problem. And we have one attendee asking about um, various types of use cases like logistics and specifically HR. So I threw up this website of Workday. I wanted to make a couple comments on that, and then maybe Gilbert, I'll bring you in to comment on the whole concept of architecture. So in terms of HR, I actually heard a rather, um, well, I'll call it, Rye, let's say, comment from an analyst a couple months ago, or a few months ago, I suppose, about going to the cloud for human resources. And I've been doing some research on this, and a lot of HR-type functions are being outsourced to the cloud. Certainly stuff like payroll is fairly easy to, to outsource these days, benefits programs, insurance, that kind of thing. But there is a real serious caveat to keep in mind, and uh, Gilbert, this is what I want you to comment on from an architectural perspective which is you have to be very careful about when you're moving to the cloud for some kind of critical business service because you either want to be uh, very strategic and very thoughtful, meaning you go through the process of making sure that you understand what's going into the cloud and what's staying on premise. And as the folks from Attunity will tell you, that's really one of the things they specialize in is making those connections such that they provide the kind of connectivity you need. Because what's happening with some organizations is they go and they'll use Workday, for example, to, uh, to port some of their HR stuff to the cloud, but they don't do it all or they don't do enough or they don't think through it enough. And what happens then? Then they wind up having to manage the cloud environment and their original on-premises environment as well, which means, guess what? <laughs> you just increased your cost, you doubled your workload, and you created lots and lots of headaches for people. And that's usually when someone gets, <laughs> gets fired and uh, then the guy who comes in has a real mess to clean up. So you really do have to think through the architecture of the data and the systems and the processes and make sure you dot all your I's and, and cross all your T's. And with that, I'll throw it over to Gilbert for comments. I'm guessing you'd agree with that, but maybe not. All right. Yeah, so just another example of something similar just yesterday happened to me. Um, so I lost one of my, my doctors because he went out of business. I know it sounds amazing. He was a chiropractor and he went out of business. I don't know why, but the <laughs> thing was this. I have no chiropractor, and I like to go to a chiropractor, uh, you know, occasionally. So I find a new one, lives close to, you know, close by and all that. It's all good. And so they go, as usual, you have to do all the paperwork and let us know, blah, 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 blah. But the good news is we have a new system because, you know, we're on the web now in the cloud. It's all cool. I go like, okay. You know, they direct me, send me a link, and I have to do all the paperwork online, which is fine. And I put all kinds of things in there that are kind of secret, like, you know, SS, you know, social security numbers and, and, and that type of stuff. And who I am, how old I am, all my details. And all I put it all in. I submit, because, of course, I do believe in technology. And then I walk up to the office the next day for my first appointment. And they go, like, did you do the form? I go, like, yes, ma'am, I did. Okay, well, we can't find it. I go, like, well, I did do it. And she goes, yes, we know, because you are the fifth person today to walk in, to walk up to me and complain about us not finding the form. And I go, but you can't be serious about that. It, this is pretty confidential information. Where is it? Hmm? <laughs> this happened to me yesterday. Yeah. Which brings back the whole issue and the whole idea of who owns the data, really, right? 
And when you move to the cloud and people get onboarded into a new system, like in this case my, my chiropractor, and they subscribe to a new system, it's in the cloud, it's all safe, it's fully multi-tenant. Um, they used to have an on-premise system, all the data was moved into the new system, but now apparently they can't get it out. Yeah, that's so not I, good. So I don't know where my <laughs> data is. And now assume she gets really mad, right? She goes like, oh, this is impossible. I pay you money and my customers are unha- my, my patients, sorry, are unhappy and with the data is gone. I want to get away from you. I want to go to a different system, maybe also in the cloud, right? How do you then move the data of your patients, in this case, the data your business owns, to another system? How do I get it out, first of all, and then load it again? I'm sure ETL in the cloud is an answer somehow, and we have experts on that. But it's not that easy. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And folks, I threw up this other slide here, or this other um, screen, to show you where you can find the archives. So anytime you want to check out, oh, there's the inside of our website. I don't want to show you that. So here is uh, the main website, and on the right co- on the right column here, you can see our different shows. So TechWise is right here. You click on that, and th- on these different pages is where we will actually post the archives. So we do archive all these webcasts. Uh, I actually want to throw it back over to Mike. I suppose, and then also to Lawrence to kind of comment on this story that Gilbert just told. So, Mike, there is some, obviously this is kind of a small business concern. You guys are more focused on big business. But nonetheless, if uh, a large company works with you and then they want to go somewhere else, how do you manage that movement of the data and securing of the data and so forth? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it's it's one that uh, – used to come up a lot more often than it does now in sales calls, <laughs> which I find to be an interesting anecdotal piece of evidence uh, for being on the call. Um, you know, I, I think that, first of all, we're talking about a lot of technologies or at least deployment models that are relatively new. It's very early in the cloud, right? We're talking about things like cloud, or in the case of data, we're talking about uh, analytic services like Hadoop or uh, databases in the NoSQL or NewSQL um, formats. You know, these are fundamentally new technologies, and especially around things like Hadoop and NoSQL, all of the ancillary services, the connectors, right, the, um, you know, if I, if, if I want to find somebody that consults on Oracle, that's something I can find. But that entire ecosystem is just kind of spinning up right now. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's getting easier day over day to say, okay, you know, give me a service that can read from X traditional system, put it into cloud and, and do something with it, and then put it back into Y traditional system. Right? And so now there are very, you know, there are quite a few of those things, and it's actually more challenging, I think, for the typical user to understand what is the best choice right, if I want to connect all the new technologies on-prem and in the cloud. And so I think as a, a cloud vendor, it's really on us to be very opinionated about that um, <laughs> and to help walk users through the landscape of possibilities because it's just a lot of new. And I think that the, the average user, whether it's a, a CTO, CIO, or whether it's actually a developer, is coming up that learning curve fairly quickly. Um, I think that a lot of the kind of baseline stuff is being worked out, cross-cloud connectors and, you know, taking away the the really most basic worries about, say, you know, bandwidth costs and whether or not you're going out on the wide area network versus staying on, you know, a VPN the entire time. A lot of those things have been kind of abstracted away in what is the true promise of the cloud. But in general, I think you're also seeing, you know, that, that anecdote that we heard was, you know, something that's probably um, isomorphic to, you know, what what happens if you're buying into a brand in a past lifetime. You know, what happens if that brand doesn't deliver? How much can I really trust that brand? I think you're seeing exactly the same thing happen in the cloud. And, you know, I think that companies like Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, um, and, and Google are, you know, very much stepping up and saying that there will at least be multiple pillars of trust <laughs> and making sure that you're not going in with a company that's going to dry up and, and swallow your data or worse, lose it or distribute <laughs> it, right? right. Um, and so they're at least there and dependable and they are anchoring, you know, the development of such ecosystem. But I'd say to close, it's very early and a lot of that tooling is just getting started and, you know, I think you're going to see consulting services you know, really putting a lot of focus on that in the very near term. Yeah, that's that's a really, really good comment you just made there. I like that uh, pillars of trust concept because the other thing to keep in mind here is you do, once again, 
have a number of fierce competitors vying for market share and for IT spend. It's just like the old days all over again, really in the old days, by which I mean last year, <laughs> you had IBM and Oracle and Microsoft and SAP and then Computer Associates and Informatica and all these companies, Teradata, et cetera. In the new world now, you've got, of course, Microsoft with their Azure, you've got Google, you've got Amazon Web Services, you know, you have Facebook in certain contexts. So you have all these companies that are not necessarily so excited about working with each other, but you do have things like APIs. And so one of the nice things is that APIs really are crystallizing into the connectors that hold together the, the, the larger cloud, I suppose. And I want to throw, uh, throw up a slide for um, Lawrence to kind of comment on all this. You know, Lawrence, obviously you guys uh, have specialized in this space for a while, so I think you do have uh, some advantage over maybe some newcomers. But nonetheless, these are all very serious concerns because how data gets stored in the cloud is different than how it gets stored on premise. And I think that uh, Mike makes a really good point that this whole space is just starting to take shape and it's going to take a while for things to, to seriously fall into place and to crystallize. So what's some advice that you have for uh, companies? Do you, I guess you basically concur with Mike or what do you think? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, what we see is when people are uh, taking advantage of, uh, of the cloud for uh, a lot of their use cases as compared to on-premise, you know, they're looking at kind of, uh, you know, two different things. One is uh, they're looking at, um, you know, as we talked about this a little bit earlier, is, you know, how, how do I, uh, how does it incrementally add value to what I do? How do I, um, you know, how is it kind of an add-on? And so, you know, I'll go back to when I talked about the e-ticks of the company where, you know, they're not moving all their operations over to, uh, to Redshift, you know, just yet per se, but they're saying, look, I, got, I do a lot of work on Oracle. I want to offload some of this, do some kind of uh, analytics in a different environment, um, you know, kind of figure out, maybe do some sandbox stuff there and then, you know, learn about my business that way. And that way they can kind of carve out what they want, move it over there and do the work, um, and, um, you know, and it's less of a concern of moving, you know, everything over and all the records and whatnot. So I think they look at that as, as one way that to take advantage of it without with having less issues. I think the other thing is people are also looking at use cases that are an, are an excellent fit for the cloud that are very, very hard to do in other ways. So um, I'll take another example. You know, we work with a company called, uh, you know, In Demand. They're a video on-demand player. Uh, they do this work for, uh, for Comcast and others. And they'll actually, um, you know, take the, the data that they're working with or take the media files um, and they'll supply it to the cloud for doing their processing, um, do their processing there, and then they'll consume it back for their on-premise customers. Um, and then, you know, that gets up to serve to third parties to, to consume and use. Um, so it's, um, you know, if you want to think about how a company is approaching it, it's, you know, how do I get my, you know, how do I add value, how do I maybe not move the whole business over at first, but how do I get the right use cases, how do I add incremental value to what I do, uh, and that helps kind of build up the, the, the confidence on what they're doing and, 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 and as part of the process. And of course, you know, a, a key piece of that is, you know, making sure that they can do that securely and, uh, and reliably, and, you know, we make sure people have the latest levels of encryption and other things to, to take care of that as much as we can on the transport side. But that's how I think a lot of companies are approaching the problem. Okay, good. And maybe Ashish, I'll throw uh, one last question over to you. I'm just throwing up. Actually, I like your architecture slide, or even this slide, I think, is, um, is pretty neat. Um, so one of the questions in, you know, HDFS, of course, by design, the default is to save every piece of data three times. You can adjust that, of course. You can make it twice. You can make it four times. That does provide uh, some overhead over time, obviously, but it is a good way of backing up data. And really, that was the whole idea, or one of the key ideas, right, from, from HDFS originally is redundancy, is not wanting to lose data. I've kind of been wondering how that's going to affect things like replication servers, quite frankly, when Hadoop does that natively. But one of the attendees is asking, can you request physical backups like tape for your cloud data, I read of a company that had their cloud management console hacked and their data and online cloud backups trashed. You know, we're hearing about these breaches all the time. They're getting more and more serious. Uh, they're, they're hitting major brands like Target, like Home Depot, et cetera. So security is an issue and backup and restore is an issue. Can you kind of talk about um, how you guys address things like backup and restore and security? Yeah, sure. So we, um 
so so i'll talk about that and talk about hdfs first uh, so as far as kubol is concerned uh, you know we since we work on the cloud we use the object store uh, there to store data so again this is one of the other key differences why you know big data service uh, on the cloud becomes different from on prem on prem you've always talked about you know hdfs and so on and so forth but if you go to the cloud a lot of the data is actually stored in their object stores uh, for example that would be an s3 on aws uh, google cloud storage on google cloud uh, on google compute engine and so on and so forth now uh, many of these object stores have built in capabilities of providing you uh, things you know these object stores by the way you know one of the big differentiators from real clouds to actually your own data center is the is is the presence of these object stores and the reason that these object stores are cool pieces of technology is uh, you know they are able to provide you very cheap uh, storage and along with that they are able to provide you things like uh, you know having the ability to actually uh, have a disaster uh, recovery uh, thing built in uh and uh, you know you know as part of that interface so you don't have to think about it and also they have tiered uh, uh you know uh you know they're steering there as well for example s3 has uh, high availability uh and on its online access uh, but it's much more expensive uh, it's more expensive than say a glacier uh storage on aws which is uh, low you know it gives you uh, you know the turnaround time is like 4 hours or something like that and it's much cheaper so you start thinking of uh, you know those types of services i think the cloud providers are essentially providing those types of services to augment the need for things like tapes and so on and so forth uh and also to provide you uh, disaster recovery uh, or uh, rather uh, you know replication uh, built in into these systems so that uh, you know you are protected from disasters regional disasters and things like that so that is what kubol heavily uh, uh you know uh, depends upon and the great thing is that a lot of all the cloud providers are providing this these are fundamentally very difficult problems to solve and by being built into some of the object stores that these cloud providers uh, provide uh, you know you, you know, that's one more additional reason of uh, you know storing this data um, uh, you know in uh, in uh, in some of these object stores and using the uh, the cloud for that as opposed to trying to you know figure out uh, you know replication uh, running two hadoop clusters across different uh you know regions and uh, you know trying to replicate data from hdfs from one region to the other which is which is doable we did that a lot when i was back at facebook uh, running this stuff there uh but the, uh, you know fundamentally the object stores in the cloud just make that this, that much more easy mhm okay great well folks we burned through an hour and 15 minutes or so with a lot of great questions there and a lot of great presentations thank you so much to all of our vendors today and of course to both of our analysts on the show today A big thank you, of course, to Cubol, Cloudent, and Attunity. We're going to put the archive up at InsideAnalysis.com. I showed you where that goes. And big thanks to our friends at Techopedia as well. So, folks, thank you again for your time and attention. This concludes episode three of TechWise, our relatively new show. We have episode four coming up uh, pretty soon. It's going to be on the big data ecosystem. So, watch for information on all that. And until then, folks, uh, thank you so much. We'll catch up to you next time. Take care. Bye bye.